So let me just start by welcoming everyone who is here. Um, lovely to be back on again. We are operating a little bit or running this session a little bit down the line from our usual first Sunday of the month. Um, and, and that's because um, this session was going to have June on, but June was juggling quite a couple of different things um, and wasn't able to come on on that first uh, Sunday in, in October. In fact, today we're talking to June from across the pond. Um, and so it's a bit later for her and really want to give her special thanks for coming on and also a special thanks to Dawn as well. And like I've shared, this has the makings for a really great session. I see that Robert has just come on. Let me just give you greetings, Robert. I noticed that you signed up what I think was this morning. Um, so good to have you on this afternoon. Mary, greetings to you over there in Texas. And Tecla, generally on. I'm looking to see Nandi come on in a little while. Um, now, this month being a Creole month, um, it, 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 it just stood to reason uh, that we would speak to our Creole aspect of being Lucian. And I posted a couple of days ago that, um, you know, it's no more than 20 million people across the world who speak a French Creole. And I really came up with that guesstimate based on the fact that a number of years ago, I remember seeing or hearing somewhere that about 8 million people across the world spoke French Creole. And I remember having a, a, a buddy, Michael Felix, who worked at NCB back when I worked there, um, go to an expo in Canada and said that they heard um, some guys speaking Patois. So they went over and spoke to them and it turns out that the guys were, I think, from Senegal or from some African country. And it was really, really amazing for them. So I just thought 8 million, let me extrapolate 20 million. Um, so when Dawn, in her usual way, came back, with no, no trick, it's more like 72 million. It instantly had me going, one, thanks Dawn, but also two, recognizing, wow, okay, so 72 million out of 7.7 .7 billion people, and I'm trying to do the math, and I'm saying, okay, this is 1%. I hope I got it right. Hopefully, if I didn't, somebody will correct me. But it, it really brought to light that point that I shared, that if we, as French Creole speakers, represent 1%, of the entire global population. Here is an avenue that makes us special if we choose to embrace that specialness. Um, and these sessions have all been about what is our unique illusion identity? How do we tap into it? How do we harness it? And how do we use it to help us to be the very best that we can be? So rather than complaining and lamenting about the challenges that exist, what if we were to celebrate the opportunities before us and use those opportunities and that celebration to propel us forward? So that by and large is what today's session is going to be about. Just exploring our unique French Creoleness um, and unique because every French Creole place has a particular essence of their own. I also want to, to remind folks that I, I have invited you to just share in, 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 in the Q&A um, your take on it, you know, on Creole, on what it can be, on some of the things that you remember growing up that really didn't have an impact on you then, but have an impact on you now, or had an impact on you from way back mm -hmm. then. But just really, really about us making today's episode a celebration of our Creoleness and then taking it forward from there. So with that sort of introduction and baseline and guidance for, for where we might take this today and who knows where it might end up, 
I would <laughs> like to invite First Dawn to just share some of her thoughts on Creoleness, on our Creoleness, on where we can take it, all those things. And then after that, I will have June come in. And from there, we will just let the session flow. So without any further ado, <coughs> let me welcome Dawn to share some thoughts, highlights, insights, etc., with us. Dawn, all yours. Thank you, Kirk, and good day. Um, I can't say fellow viewers today, I'm on the other side of the divide today. So as I already indicated, we are in Creole Heritage Month, but by coincidence, by design, it is also the second annual Caribbean Folklore Month. It was something that was proposed by the Caribbean Books Foundation based in Trinidad, and they have been pushing back on Halloween and say, you know, we have enough characters to fill an encyclopedia. We don't need um, Halloween, we can have our own zombie night. And so because of some of the books that I've written in the past, um, looking at, if you want, things that go bump in the night, I was really excited and I'm really, you know, like projecting 10, 15, 20 years down the road. How will these two commemorative activities merge in St. Lucia? Because Creole, as, as Dean Poulet pointed out recently in the panel discussion, is not just about the language. It's about who we are as a people, it's the foods. When I was at university, I missed the foods more than the language. I spoke language, you know, I spoke the Creole with my aunt down in London, but the foods at, at Easter and, and Christmas, I would miss that. And, you know, people, historians will tell you that to control a people, the first step is to wipe their identity. And the colonials seem to have instinctively understood that. And out of a desire to strip us of who we are, and when I say us, I'm mixed heritage. So I'm not just talking about the Afro side of things. I'm also talking about the Indo side of things. Because I don't, you know, listening to the lectures, they don't seem to have been, the, you know, the smidgen of difference between the two. I mean, Indians needed a paper pass to walk around the place. They would not allow them to wear the madwas. They made them wear white because they needed to see them in the bush. So, you know, it wasn't an easy time for the Indians that came over after the emancipation um, um, part of things happened. But in the attempt to strip us of who we are, much has blossomed. Our storytelling, our foods, if you look at some of the foods that we treasure that are gourmet foods now, black pudding, that's blood, that's scraps, that's what the guys didn't want. Um, um, sauce, <laughs> they didn't want the pig's feet and the pig ears, they gave it to us. Float and bake, <laughs> they, they just gave us salt and flour. Our ancestors took that and made the foods that, that we identify in St. Lucia and by extension, the Caribbean. The stories, the Anansi stories are right through the Caribbean. The things that go bump in the night, you know, we, we are a strong Christian society. You know, there, there, there are a few others, you know, a few Jews, a few Muslims, um, Baha'i and others, but fundamentally we are a Christian society. But, uh, you know, what we do in the day and what we do at night is two different things. And, and we were having that discussion about the duality in St. Lucia. So, you know, during the day, it's one face and at night, we buy the garden looking to tie our partner in the Creole, we call it to marry them. <clears throat> so we draw back in horror from the Bolum and the La Jables. But, you know, any news item, you just have to wait long enough and it appears as a headline in the news. Um, last year, we had the altar at the Bank of St. Lucia, and we had a couple of exit names of it outside NBC Studios. This is something that my people believe in. And I always wonder, because in Greek mythology, the Greeks believed in the gods the same way we believe in these characters. But at what point did it become mythology for them? And how many years, a hundred, a thousand years for us when we will look back at these characters and, and not believe in them the way we do at the moment. Many people draw back in horror from these characters, the Bolom, the Dwen, the Laja Bless, the Majinwe. And I don't want my child in that. I don't want my child to be anywhere that. And I respect that. But I also think to myself, how is your child going to recognize what you perceive to be as evil? If you do not educate your child in who we are, how can your child stand and defend itself in the face of anything? Um, we go overseas and that is when we appreciate what it is to be St. Lucian. We go to university, we go to work, we migrate. Um, and 
that is when we, rec we start to understand what it is um, in this mass of humanity who we are and what grounds us to this planet. Um, I just want to say one more thing that, you know, the mythology for St. Lucia um, is not only the high end of these characters. I've been having some discussions recently, maybe because it's um, um, Caribbean folklore month. You know, the cockroach flying at night means rain is going to fall. You want someone to leave your home that's overstayed, you turn the broom upside down. The lizard fall on the man means his woman is pregnant. Um, the one I heard this week that I had never heard about, that David in blue soap will bring you good luck. I had not heard that one and I got that one this week. So I just wanted to put out that out there that things that go bump in the night, for lack of a better description, is also part of who we are as St. Lucians and as Caribbean people. And later on in the discussion, um, uh, we can discuss how, it dif how it's different in some of the other islands, but I'll pause there for a moment. Thanks wow. so much, um, Dawn, for those opening remarks um, and insights, truly titillating. Um, one thing that stood out for me was um, you speaking about Greek mythology. And um, when one speaks of mythology, it really is about elevating whatever the story is of that set of people to a higher level, to another level. And it then begs the question, what do we consider to be our mythologies? And even um, in, in recent times, I think over the last week, two weeks, I have been looking at a lot of what has come out of Africa, Tony Browder, um, and I'm going to see if I can find a link and, and, and share it. Um, and learning now, becoming aware that the Greeks and the Romans actually went to, to Egypt, to Kemet, to study. And that Pythagoras, for instance, spent time in Egypt. And that's where he learned. But isn't it interesting that we speak of Pythagoras's theorem? but it actually came from somewhere else. And um, getting into Luxor and realizing that what we consider to be Greco-Roman architecture and columns actually came out of Egypt, which is in Africa. Um, and, and I'm sharing this just to take us to how far back we go and from how far back this has come. Um, I have been doing some stuff at Fongelib, and I remember one year seeing um, the kids down there, some of the kids dressed up as masquerade with all of the frilly stuff, you know, on the clothes and the mask. And then sometime afterwards, looking at the Dogon out of Africa and out of Benindia and, and um, the dances that they do. And I went, oh my God, but look at that, the costume is the same. And you go, wow, look at how it has been transposed with us. So even as you speak, Dawn, to, to the Indian side and the African side and what came over and how the colonizers worked to keep it away from, keep us away from it, how it has survived and how we have embraced it and how it has held us together and sometimes if we even think about it, when we think about uh, all of the trials and tribulations that we have gone through as non-Europeans, because as you say, uh, it wasn't only the Blacks who suffered, you know, um, in a lot of instances, if it wasn't for this aspect of our spirituality or another realm that we held there, um, maybe many more of us might have committed suicide might have felt that we couldn't bear the burden. So I just thought that I would take a moment to tie that back round. Um, and again, just looking forward to how this unfolds. And let me also invite June in to share some insights from her perspective. So June, all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's really interesting listening to 
um, to Dawn and to yourself talking about all the mythology and all the things that we believe in. But um, one of the things that really bothers me a lot about us as St. Lucians is that a lot of the times, the things that we practice, the things that we do, we just do them because we know they were done by our parents before. And um, we don't really understand why we do them. I am one of those firm believers. Um, I know everybody loves to bandy around this phrase. I am proud to be St. Lucian. I have national pride. But I'm not so sure what that means. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of different countries that formed us or from who, whose influences made us the Caribbean people that we are, okay? And um, we need to understand it. I have to say that there was a lot done to make sure we did not understand a lot of our history. And um, I mean, I was a history teacher for years and, it, and I mean, I began to realize that history was being taught by books being written by the colonizer. Um, there were very few history books written by West Indians. And one of the things that I, I need for us to, to think about is that in order for us to understand all the things that we do so that we can understand who we are, we have to start from the beginning. And the beginning did not start in the Caribbean. The beginning started in different places. Um, when it comes to traditions and stuff like that, and the dark side, you will hear people say things, oh, St. Lucians are so superstitious. Um, yes, we are. And, but a lot of what we believe in, we can actually link to what people from Christian churches believe in. They believe in a God that they've never seen. They believe in, 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 in all different types of things. They believe in miracles, that miracles happen. They believe that you pray, if you pray long and hard enough for something, it will happen. I know, I'm a believer, I believe that. But why then do we decry those who do not believe in the same things that we believe in? For example, Kirk, I'm going back to your point about the children from Forja Lima. Um, I'm sure a lot of people looking and listening do not even know the history of Forja Lima, right? And if they understood the history of Forja Lima, they would understand the connection to our African heritage. Um, of course, we have had several eons of making sure that we do not know anything about our African history. People will say things, oh, that came from our African culture. Africa is a very big place. Africa is a very big place. Not every African does the same thing that other Africa, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge place. And we have to try and understand that, that's one. Two, we have to understand our, where our influences came from, Kirk. And our influences came from the people who were found here, the indigenous people who were found here, our first discoverers, okay? Our first discoverers were not European. Our first discoverers were already here when the Europeans came. We need, we need to understand that. I'm sure, Kirk, you and Dawn, do you know very much about our Amerindian history? No, we don't. We only, we only understand it from the little things that we see. We have never been encouraged to look into the people who influenced us. And I'm saying, if we have to even understand what it is who made, who make us, what it is that has made us St. Lucia, we have to understand all the influences of our history, even the ones that a lot of people don't want us to even think about. So um, St. Lucia's culture is rich, it's beautiful. 
people are still fighting the language. I look at um, June Creole and International Creole, Month, Creole Heritage Month. People do not even make the effort to try and get the correct spelling of our Creole words. And when you try to correct, they, they, they see it as a war. You know, so there's so much about us we need to believe in before we can truly say, I am Lucian. And how do we do that? How do we do that? What kind of history should we teach? And how do we teach that history? We cannot teach history the same way I was taught history when I was in school eons ago. We have to teach history that is relevant. We have to teach a living history and then make the connection to the living history. Everybody knows my passion. My passion in case for those who don't know is traditional masquerade. And it's very simple. It was a tradition that I grew up with as a child. If there was no traditional masquerade, there was no Christmas for us growing up as children. If there was no Asu Square, there was no Christmas season as children. So, I mean, it's something that I'm passionate about. I hear people say all the time, you still in that? Yes, I am. And I will continue to be until I die. Because through the traditional masquerade, we can learn about our history. Okay, so I'll stop here for now. I see if anybody has anything to add or subtract. Okay, well, so the only thing, if I may, is yeah. that one of the things, um, if, if you go to the, the, the various lectures and you follow people that discuss this, um, particularly Hazel Simmons McDonald, who is a linguist, mm -hmm. you will realize that to call it French Creole is so wrong. Yes. Because she has traced this language back to the, 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 the nations on the west coast of Africa the Creole, and, and up to this week, there was a panel discussion on NTN talking about La Maguid, but I mean, they strayed into the culture and, and Dr. Um, Dalfinis was showing the linkages through the language back to Africa of, of taking, <clears throat> I mean, the, 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 maybe the French word is why we call it, I don't know, maybe that's why we call it French Creole and, and trying, to, trying to make a new language because as I said in my in my opening salvo, is that the first thing you do is strip people of their culture, and you make, if you mix people from different African tribes, they cannot talk to each other, and so that's one way of of diluting any um, rebellion. What did my people do? They just made a new language. Yeah, and this is what we have today. So we have to understand, and as you said rightly, so. Um, a lot of where we come from. And I just know a little bit because I'm nosy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, we, the thing about it is, um, I will also say, yes, this is International Creole Heritage Month and Creole Heritage Month and October 20th is International Creole Day, Jeune Creole. And again, we cannot appreciate who we are if we do not understand where we are from, our history, what made us who we are. And we need to understand our history so that those kinds of things do not repeat themselves. Okay. It is very important. Um, there is a lot there. <laughs> Ah, there's just so much cook. I don't even know if you're going to have the time to do all of this, but I'm going to try to say as much as I can. Um, St. Lucia is at a beautiful place right now. It is a place where we are now understanding that those people who were the keepers of our traditions, we now understand that one of the reasons why a lot of a lot of youngsters, a lot of people don't know it and appreciate it is because they held it really close to their hearts. They were afraid to let it go because they thought that if they let it go, it would die or it would become something else. I mean, even let's look at the attempts that were made with the language, the language Creole. 
um, we, the Folk Research Center and the Moqueol folks did a wonderful job in actually getting it as an acceptable language, Creole. I still, we still, however, we still hear people refer to it as Patois. We still hear people say French Creole. We have a written language, it's called Creole. But one of the things Folk Research Center did and the people connected with the movement um, and which is, which is being corrected now, they held it really close to their hearts. They made little attempts to teach it, but, it um, but I do not think that the attempts, the attempts that were made were what they knew how to do. And I think it is only now, because if for instance, you go on Instagram or any one of those places, Jason Joseph has done some wonderful work in, on teaching the Creole, right? Um, and it is something that, you know, that we need to be proud of. And I remember all the while trying to do the traditions, the traditional masquerade. I was being told by the older people, the youngsters do not want to learn. I understood that. And you know why I understood that? Because the way they knew how to teach it, the youngsters could not identify with. Okay. The youngsters could not identify with the ways they wanted to teach it because they were teaching it the same way they were taught. And youngsters these days, they're just too bright for that. They're just too bright for that. Yeah. One of the things that I think we need to really instill, and I don't think Creole and Creole Heritage Month should be the only time that we bring out our St. Lucian-ness, our Creole-ness, no. I think that should be year round. Yes, it's a great celebration in October, but let's keep doing it all year round. And that's one, one of the reasons too why I'm so passionate about the traditional masquerade. Um, I am passionate about it because I think it's a tradition that is indigenous to us. It is a tradition that should not die. Um, and I have found that youngsters are really interested in learning. I mean, everybody is not going to be interested in everything, okay? There are people who are interested in reading books written by St. Lucian and others who are not. There are people who are interested in things that they get on the internet and there are others who are not. What we need to do is to immerse our young St. Lucians in every possible way that we can. If we don't know how, we need to get a young person working with us to teach us how, so that people can understand where we came from, what we are, and where we are going. Because I don't know, people keep, thinking this is not important, but it is. Okay, because I can even look at another aspect of it. Our, our drive for tourism, which is one of our mainstays in St. Lucia. We are not supposed to do stuff just for the tourists. The stuff that we do is supposed to be something that we so believe in that the tourist is attracted to it. And unless we can get to that stage, we are not ready to say, I am Lucian. So um, if I just jump back in, and, and I allowed quite a bit of free reign because one, I mean, June, both yourself and Dawn, you are so passionate about this. And, and I, I think that it's so important for us to bring the passion out because, <coughs> excuse me, all too often, we have remained, we have kept this, which is uniquely ours, hidden away in the shadows. I thought it interesting as well, June, that you spoke about history and the way history was taught, um, you know, and history taught in schools. And it took me back to, to that book, which many of us would be familiar with doing, doing history in secondary school, The Making of the West Indies. Making of the West Indies, yep. And I wonder how many people actually know that that book, the author of that book was Professor Roy Auger, who is St. Lucian. 
And coming back to speaking about celebrating what is ours, I only realized that when I went to UWE mm -hmm. and Professor Ogier was held in high esteem, um, you, you, you spoke as well about stuff that has come out of, of Africa and um, speaking to some of those traditions, the masquerade, et cetera. Um, again, and, and I think that it's important for us to recognize um, here you had, if you go back to how we ended up here, here you had a small group of people, the planters, controlling a large mass of people. And the only way, or one of the most effective ways of ensuring their survival was really to take away the sense of self. And it has perpetuated even to today. So we think of, of um, voodoo, for instance, which we have all been taught is very negative. It's the dark side. But where did voodoo come from? Actually came out of Benin. Now- um, More importantly, who told us? Who told us? Right, Elizabeth? right. So that would have come out of, again, the church. So now that's control. But the interesting thing, if you actually go and look at Benin, think of the Benin bronzes. So now think about, wow, um, the, the sophistication of those people. Um, think now, looking back, so going back to, to voodoo coming from there, voodoo from, for them is actually a positive celebration. And think as well, again, I think I posted something down there, Don, I'm taking over from you a little bit today. <laughs> uh, in That's good. Links. Um, and I shared some stuff about the Dogon. Um, yep. Hey, they have said that they came from, from, from what is Sirius now B. recognized as Sirius B, Sirius B. right? Um, um, a black, a, 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 a white dwarf, right? And which isn't visible to the naked eye, but they've always known of it, yeah. you know? So now um, let's come back and speak to our things that are unique to us. And as we dig deeper into them, we can find value. Now, I want to take a moment just to acknowledge some comments that have come in and also invite folks um, to share thoughts, um, share your stories, just post a little something and then we can, we can pick up on it. Um, so quite early on, uh, Sylvester shared, so wonderful to see June and Dawn. Looking forward to this session so much more than any other. Um, Sylvester, thanks for that. And it is so understandable um, with all of, of your, your awareness and your sharing and your, your um, taking forward history and culture, etc. So absolutely understandable, those comments. Uh, Robert, um, gosh, you're on today for the first time, I think, but great to see that you're, you're sharing some stuff here. And Robert asks, do we as St. Lucians think that we do enough to reach outside of our Creole sphere to invite or encourage our non-Creole speaking regional neighbors to understand and appreciate our Creole language and traditions? So let me just, just uh, let you ladies sort of share some thoughts on that. And then I can um, put some more comments there, in. There is a, I'm not sure about sharing. Um, well, if they share, you know, we always like to share the national word. Um, that's that always gets shared. It's now, it's now international. It's now an international word. Um, but you know what has I have observed from listening to my parents and that generation, and even happened to me when I studied because I studied in England. We tend again. We recognize who we are when we leave home, so we use the language to communicate with each other and keep persons out. And so um, I, have, I have gone, so for example, I've gone to Dominica with non-Creole speakers to run workshops. And when we do the icebreaker and, and, and we introduce, 
I say to the participants, tell me this what about guy. Me say pan cop and koyo let's so see a black person. Ah, we all see, and everybody starts to laugh. But I make them understand that not all the instructors are not uh, are non Creole speakers because we tend to use it. And this is why, if I understand correctly, that the Southern Islands lost the Creole, Trinidad, Grenada you will hear people tell you that their grandparents used to use it. And anytime they wanted to have a conversation to keep the children out, they would have that conversation in Creole. So we have used it among ourselves to exclude persons. But as June is, is speaking to the fact that now we are looking at, at teaching it, all that may change because mm -hmm. we're looking that that's an expansive um, position, not a, an exclusive position. And also, if I may, I wanted to pick up on what June said. Um, we like to say this, that the children are not interested. And that is not my experience. And I know that is not June's experience mm -hmm. either. Um, Nobel Laureate Festival um, is in January and COVID burst in March. And that year, I, I was talking to the children because I'd done the peanut story, peanuts and the Caribbean myths. The children know Medusa. They know Thor. They know Spider-Man. They do not know our characters. Now, whose fault is that? We have to look in the mirror and say, hey, it is my it fault. Is mm -hmm. So when I began, to, and the teachers did not know either, interestingly. So when I began to talk about the characters, the children were full of questions. They wanted to know more. You know, I just dropped a line on Facebook this week. Then you should see the comments on that. Even, even Auntie June was on my case. <laughs> right? Um, and, and this, the bus came for the children and suddenly the teacher says, oh my God, the bus is there half an hour. We have to go, we have to go. The children were riveted to the seat. They did not want to leave. And that is always my experience when mm -hmm. I have to engage with, with young children. Um, you speak to them in a language they can understand and they are sponges. They want to learn, they want to know. Mm -hmm. Recently, um, earlier this year, CDF dropped a link um, by a young lady, let me see if I have it there, um, called Courtney Green. This, she, she's a St. Lucian at the time, she's studying at Nova Scotia College for Art, and she had a class assignment animation, and I had to do a one minute animation. Guess what she did? She did La Jablais. She mm -hmm. did a one minute story in animation of La Jablais, because now leaving home, she's overseas without maybe even realizing it, She's now grounding herself in what it is to be a Saint Lucian and maybe by extension, a Caribbean person. Yep. So don't yeah, and thanks, thanks so much, um, June. Um, yes. Let me invite some thoughts from you and then I'm going to pick up a couple more comments that are coming in and the comments are actually coming in quite fast and furious. I'm <laughs> loving this. Okay, um, I want to deal with the question asked about sharing with um, non-Creole speakers. I just want to let him know that it's not, I, I'm not sure. Okay, let me, let, me, let me tell you exactly what it is. Please, we are exactly trying desperately to get yeah. our own people on board with the Creole. And we cannot go out there and try to bring in people and try to make it something unless we ourselves know it and believe in it. Um, and I think that's one of the problems as much. I find that there are a lot of non-St. Lucians who are more interested in the queer language than St. Lucians themselves. Um, we had this, this um, linguist, Michael Walker from Canada, I think, and Michael, just fell in love with the language. He has written over a hundred plus workbooks, teaching children and adults the language in a way that not only helps them learn the language, but it helps to solidify the English as well, right? And for some reason, there has always been a pushback. He was given them free of charge. And from what I understand, I could be very wrong. They were all sent to the Ministry of Education some years ago and nothing was done. And it is because I am sh there is a pushback from our people about teaching. I am still 
looking at, I don't know, Dawn, if you saw some of the comments when they, somebody was talking about teaching the Creole language. And, the spelling uh, D. And somebody says, yes, the spelling D, the that's spelling right. D and somebody comment. says, why are we teaching children Creole? That is going to keep them back. I have not heard somebody say that for years. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that people still thought that way, but it was something that had come straight down from our colonial past where doing anything that the colonial masters did not understand was to be, you know, was Ridiculous. to be shot up. So I just want, I, I, yeah, I just want to tell the folks that think we should share that I'm sure there is a lot of sharing going on. I'm not, I'm not very sure at what level, but we are really busy trying to get our people to understand and appreciate the language before we can really say, let's do something formal out there. I mean, there are so many countries. I mean, I have had friends. Um, there's one from Antigua in particular who has been brought up in St. Lucia. And he, every time he sees me, he says, what is this thing about, uh, about, about Creole or Pato, whatever you call it? It is mean, just there to keep back people who talks that language. You know, and, and, and why do we need that language? So it is something that we have to get away from people, that kind of thinking. It is such a beautiful language to learn. It is such a beautiful language to know, but we have to try and get our own people on board after which we will share in, in a formal way but we need to get our people on board first. And that is a very difficult thing. I have never understood why there was such a pushback against teaching Creole in schools. We teach French, we teach Spanish. I know the people out there are going to say, oh, well, you can learn, you can, you can speak French when you go out there and you can speak Spanish, but hell, we can speak Creole. Um, we can speak Creole. There are so many people in the world, Seychelles, Mauritius, so many, countries in the Caribbean that can understand and speak to each other. There's absolutely no reason why we should decry our language like that. Um, <laughs> so me. thanks for that, June. And even as you speak to um, Creole and Creole being taught in schools and you know the pushback and so on, here's the interesting thing. I, I think that it must start first from within us. And as you were speaking to that, I thought for a moment about the Syrian community. And you might go past and see two Syrians who live locally in St. Lucia, speaking to each other in a language that we don't understand. It's not taught in school, it's taught from home. And um, let's just imagine now, if there was that embracing of quail, starting from the home, and there are certain things that a mother or father will say to their children in quail that has a distinct and specific meaning like it can have in no other language. And I'm making the point about coming from the home because we're coming back and always at the focal point of being Lucian mm -hmm. and what is our, our unique sensibility and what is its value. And that is an area where there is great value because coming from home, there's that sense of self-worth and uniqueness that would be instilled. Yeah, but 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 yeah, that bit, yeah. Yeah, but for people in my generation, right, that's what coming up, my parents spoke fluent Creole, but they never taught us. Yeah. I know their parents who speak fluent Creole and do not want to hear their children utter one Creole word because they have been, um, they have been taught, yeah. socialized to believe that it will keep them back. Now, when you spoke about the Syrian, the Syrian community, I laughed because one day I was somewhere sitting eating and these two young Syrian guys that I've known since they were little came and sat. And the quail that erupted from out of their mouths, I went into total shock because 
I know they have their own language and they speak, but my my boys were speaking their Creole. Huh? Yeah. So it's 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 just we like what like I'm saying, I like where St. Lucia is at now. I think that the push for teaching Creole, um, the push for for oh, and the other thing was the theater arts that is now a subject in school is giving us the opportunity to teach the youngsters about their culture and tradition. So I will have youngsters coming to me to talk about masquerade. People will have youngsters going to them to talk about the, the flower festivals. I mean, it's, it has given a, another impetus to this push for our Creoleness, our Creolization for the want of a better word. And I think that is all the first rungs of the ladder towards getting us to understand that how solution we are. But there is also a danger, right? That I, I, I need for us to understand. Dawn was, um, Dawn said about it earlier on. It is because we were so devoid of anything else but the English history and culture and whatever. Um, and they made sure that nothing about African history could be taught, nothing. It's the same is true about Indian history. The same is true about the history of the Amerindians, the same is true. And I think we now have to let people understand the influences that made us who we are. For instance, I, I think Dawn is almost the same as I am. I am a doogler. One day I said that and somebody looked at me and said, well, why should you say that? I said, because that's who I am. My mother was Indian, her parents were from India. My dad is black. His dad was black from Africa. He came in from Barbados, but he has African roots. So I am a doogler. And there is nothing wrong with saying I am a doogler. The only difference is that I have more information now about my Black history than I have about my Indian history. And that is why when I was working with the Cultural Development Foundation, I had been commissioned to contracted to do children's, a children's um, program. And the last one I did was film. And I said, a lot of the kids don't know the history of St. Lucia. Let us do the history of St. Lucia in film. And what we did, we divided them up into groups. And each, and I said, the history of St. Lucia did not start in St. Lucia. The history of St. Lucia started where the, those people came from and let us go back to what, where they came from and see if we can understand the route that it took to come here and the influences that it gave. I would love to see that film shown over and over again at Emancipation, over and over again during Junior Creole. But for some reason, it has never hit the airwaves. I, I don't know why. And it is something that we need to keep immersing our children in. Be immersed in your history, be immersed in your culture. Because the reason why we're getting so much pushback is because people don't know. And yes. there is no, and when you don't know, you can't understand or appreciate. Yes. So I think that is one of the reasons why we get in such great pushback. So true. Now I want to push on a little bit because, like I said, <laughs> comments are coming in fast and furious. Okay. So here is, and, and I think that it's testimony to the engagement that we are having. Um, so Trudy, thanks for this. Uh, Trudy reaches out, and this one is for you, June. Hi, June. I was very interested in your clarification that Creole is not French Creole, etc. A few years ago, I bought five booklets, Boss and Lucie, Palais, Palais Equi Creole. Um, yes, yes. Oh, okay, Boss and Lucie, Palais Equi Creole. Um, Equi Creole. Um, Creole by Michael Walker. Mm -hmm. It did make it easier for me to pronounce the language. So is this our Creole? 
that's that's Trudy's question. For Michael Walker, definitely is. This nice. man fell in love. This man fell in love with our language, and as a linguist, he wanted it to be taught, and he came up with teachers' manuals and Creole workbooks and so on to make teaching the Creole easy. Yes, it is. I mean, we you, you will. There are a various number of reasons why there may have been French influences there, but when people like Hazel McDonald Simmons did Simmons McDonald did her stuff, the revelations that came with her research mm -hmm. were totally mm -hmm. amazing for everybody. Everybody. It is our language, ladies and gentlemen, is not French Creole. Our language is Quayol. It has its own syntax, its own method of writing, its own rules, and it's easier to learn than English. If I may add, Cook, to that yeah. question, is that I think in the 1970s, um, Dame Paulette and a number of other linguists in the region um, <clears throat> agreed as to the spelling, because for a long time, Creole was not a written language. Creole. Yep. They agreed as to what the spelling and, and all the whatever the, the rules that go yep. with it. And this is why we're able to have the dictionary. So we even go a step further to call it Antillian Creole, because yes. um, it's, it's the same for the cluster, um, Guadeloupe, Dominica, Matnix, and okay. Lucia, I think Cayenne. Um, they all got together and they agreed that this is what we as a collective in the region would speak and how we yes. would spell it. Yes, okay. that is very correct. Thanks, thanks for that, Dawn. Um, let me go on to this comment coming in from Ronnie. Um, hey, greetings, Ronnie. And I think that Ronnie is over in California, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, so Ronnie says that there was a pushback within society years ago that that Creole was the language of the country people, that if you speak it, you were known as a country bookie. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. And that was a way of dividing and conquering. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had to put a division and make people believe that everything from the rural areas in St. Lucia was beneath everything that was from the, the, the people in town, as they call them. Right. Um, that is why I have such a problem when people talk about what do they say? They don't the say out, other communities. Out districts. The the out districts. Districts. What yeah. is an out district? <laughs> right. It is not an out district. It's the other communities, the other communities. And, and whether we like it or not now, everybody, there is a mishmash of everybody in in in, in Castries. You know, there are people who are born and bred in castries, but the majority of people who are there now have their roots in one or more of the rural, con or rural communities. So, yes, we were called people in the rural areas were called country bookies because they had substandard, um, some of them had substandard educational systems that were just not on par with the ones in Castries. Yes, we understand that. Um, for a long time, there was a lot of hatred for Castries people from people in the other communities until of course they became Castries people. And then who are you going to hate yourself? So, I mean, and a lot of things that the rural folks had, the rich cultural heritage that they had and they were immersed in from young came over to Castries when they came. And, and so now, I mean, that whole thing about people being country bookies, what is a country bookie? What? There is no, a country bookie just does not exist. And if it exists, it exists only in the minds of people whose minds have not developed, okay? Because there is no such thing as a country bookie. That is just passe, and people should not even say it, just like they should not say the, um, what, what, Don, the what districts? The out districts. The out districts, the same way they should not say that, just make sure it just is not said, because there is no such thing. My parents, my dad's family was from Mark, my mom was from Beaufort, so I guess that made me total contribuki, okay? But I could not speak the Creole. 
Yeah, so I think, I think these are things that we should have grown out of. If you, people have not grown out of it, it's time. Mm -hmm. It's time because it's part of who we are. And it is time for us to stop allowing other influences to dictate who we should be. Yeah? Um, if I can just, uh, thanks for that, June. And if I can just uh, share some, some insights as well. And I'm, I'm really smiling right now because I, I have been blessed and I've had the good fortune of having connected not only with the folks at Fongelib, but down in the countryside. And I'm saying the countryside with a particular reverence. Um, they've got a different way of life. They move mm -hmm. to the beat of a beat different of drum. drum. Yes. That's right. And yep. also, being in some of their groups, the WhatsApp groups and so on, I am always blown away by their celebrations. It's a birthday. Um, it's 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 an anniversary. It's a whatever. You're going to see them out at the hotels with the nicest cake in the nicest outfit with some exotic yeah. drinks. Um, one guy who said to me, oh, it's my birthday, but we rent in a villa, come down and check us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, or on a Friday afternoon, stopping by, having some of them take me out to their favorite watering holes, where you just go and pick up whatever you want. And then at the end of it, you go give the people money. Um, so it's it's such a beautiful way of life. Yeah. And June, as you spoke to the divide and conquer bit, I would like to invite and encourage folks who haven't spent much time south of Castries, south of Bexon, south of cul-de-sac, to take some time and just get out and stop at the little cabaways mm -hmm. and just engage with the people. And you, you will sometimes find, oh my God, but our histories are so interconnected. Exactly. Someone I know or some member of my, 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 my wife or my husband's family. And you start to make the connections. And by the time you're done, you're leaving with a bag of food. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And a whole new yeah. branch to your family tree. And a whole oh, yes. new branch to your oh, family. Yes. Yes. So I wanted to share that. Um, let me just invite Donna. Some quick thoughts. June, I get the sense that you have a little bit more to say. And then, but let's mm -hmm. keep it kind of tight. And we're going to jump back in. Let me yes. pull up some more comments. Yes, I see where well, the, 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 the Q&A ticking like, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kicking in, but it's great. Kicking. So yeah. quickly, you know, um, um, June and I live around the corner from each other at the morn, but uh, my experience is slightly different because my parents had a working farm and, and the workers came from La Flamengo. And so it was really a case of a village raising a child. Because when I constructed a sentence badly in English, I got corrected. When I constructed the sentence badly in Creole, I got corrected. So I, I, I you know, I may be probably illiterate in Creole be, because I grew up with the two languages just being naturally corrected in whichever tongue. And that is what we need because I think we, we alluded to the family unit a while ago and that, but as June said, um, sadly some of us are not in a position now to pass it on to our children, even if we wanted to. So it, it falls now to the state. And um, I see now we have 13 questions. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, on, on point, Dawn, and let me tell you, the people at Pongelim, they got tired telling me, take my word. <laughs> and I'm being told that I'm not talking patois, is Pakatai talking. <laughs> but also, you know, just, um, one of the things that June said that resonated with me, and I tell people, because we have this thing, I, I, I learned a phrase a few years ago called code switching. And English is creeping into the Creole like some invasive species. Yep. Um, my parents' generation, which is the same generation as June, speak fluent Creole. Mm -hmm. They speak fluent English, 
and never mix the two. That's right. So why are we mixing the two? That's because, that is because a lot of people never learned the language from the authentic source, if, for want of a better word. No the, and because of that, they had, when they, they would pick up one or two things, but because they didn't know it, they would just put in a little English word. And it's, because, it's, 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 just a lack, it's just a lack of knowing the language. But yeah. I have to say at this point, I learned to love my country, my communities, from my dad and my mom first and foremost, and then from Folk Research Center and the National Trust. I mean, I learned about St. Lucia in such a rich way that I am really hoping that Folk Research Center can pick up again mm -hmm. and do what they're doing and that the St. Lucia National Trust actually reaches more youngsters with some of the stuff that we're doing. But I think, you know, Kirk, you, Don, and I can create something, you know, because Don has her wonderful books yes. on the whole of everything in St. Lucia. Yes. And if we team that up with you and Forsha Lieb and all your, we can do something. I think, I think what we need to do now is immerse our youngsters in yes. what we may have missed out on, but yes. we don't want them Let to miss out on. Agreed. Yeah? Agreed. Agreed. And, and, and with that said, in fact, you know, um, June, this is a lovely segue. Um, I, I have always shared that for panelists who come on, I want to invite you that if you've got anything that you want to share, product, for instance, that, you know, can be of value to our audience, um, you know, by all means, use this platform to get the word out because um, we spoke earlier, I think June, you made reference to it, the divide and rule, um, but really it is for us to, I was going to say come together and multiply, but then that has interesting <laughs> connotations. So, uh, it's it, your African, that's too far. Yeah, yeah. It is, <laughs> for us to embrace and support each other. Yes. Um, I, I, I will use that as diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, well, okay. Um, those who know me know what my passion is. I will continue developing and teaching traditional masquerade of St. Lucia until I die. Um, I have my last book my, is a resource book called the, Tradition, the Traditional Masquerade of St. Lucia. It's available on Amazon. It's available at Folk Research Center um, and at 758 Books in Leclerc. So it's, it's something that anybody who just loves our culture and wants to, 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 to know more about it, feel free. I also, have a, I also have a blog, a Facebook, Facebook blog called Culture Corner St. Lucia, S-T-L-U-C-I-A dot com. And it's where I am trying to use the traditional masquerade to teach the history of St. Lucia. Just in a, you know, a very simple way. Um, I have to update, it has been updated for a little while, but not much of it can change actually. It really goes through the history. And I'm also the producer of a youth and arts theater company of youngsters who started as Kitty Crew Theater Company. And before that was kiddiecrew.com, our children's television program. But um, that theater company has been started so that we can highlight the work of our local playwrights. And we started off with Roderick Walcott, we go, and we went on to Drina Fedrick and Kendall Hippolyte. And this year we just did a brunch hit theater written by, the play written by one of our older students who now make up the co-management team of the group. We also have a traditional masquerade group. And we come out every year at Christmas time, although there is one group who can come out all during the year, actually we're going to be performing for Junior Creole at different places. So people, I need, I, we need support. We need people to understand. I'm going to continue teaching. I still find I have not reached enough people um, 
as far as I want to reach up the masquerade, we're trying to now bring the masquerade back to the original community so that they can again take ownership of it. Um, and our biggest, our biggest um, project has just been launched. We are doing a film written by one of our seniors, again, two of our seniors, um, on, based on the masquerade characters of St. Lucia. It's called Murder in the Masquerade. It's a six episode film. And of course, we want everybody, even if it's a little $10 that you can give, please feel free, we'll, we'll be sending out our platforms and so on so that people can give us. It's very costly, but I intend to do it because it has to become the Christmas movie of St. Lucia. You know, like how you have Netflix and, and Hallmark, Hallmark Christmas <laughs> movies. That will be our St. Lucia Christmas movie. So look out for that and you will, you will see the development of it as it goes on. So thanks for that, um, June. Uh, I was just trying to post some of the links, um, but Dawn, I have to confess, I am nowhere near your proficiency. <laughs> um, I don't have access to the chat um, today, so I have to send to you. Um, and then okay, to that's what it is. But yeah, we you, send to you. Let me yeah. just let everyone know um, that I am going to make sure that all of the links are shared uh, in, in the replay that's going to come through. And Dawn, let me just invite you to talk a little bit about your stuff, and then we're going to jump right back in to other comments coming in. God, we have gotten on the other side of the top of the hour. Where are the <laughs> questions gone? to go? Well, you know, um, everybody knows now about the peanut tails. Yes, Mama um, Peanut, Mama Pistache. <laughs> um, um, she's a little eight-year-old, and through her, you know, a lot of information is imparted to children. Um, I have the Creepy Creepy Tour. Um, you dropped the link for my Amazon, so you can go and get the Creepy Creepy Tour. When I needed to write the Creepy Creepy Tour, I just came on my Facebook and said, people, give me the stories. And someone said, but you can make them up. I said, no, no, no. Sanusha has too much of this for me to go and make up any stories. So, yeah. Um, the Creepy Creepy Tour is a ghost tour of St. Lucia. The only thing is that the ghost tour is fiction, but all the stories on the ghost tour are people's um, experiences. So you can go get that. And it's really good. It's really, really good. That Creepy Creepy Tour. And Dawn, we still have to do it. A real <laughs> Creepy Creepy Tour. Every, whenever we need to do it. Yes. Okay. It, starts, it starts in every cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that. And let me push on and take in some more of the comments that are coming in. Hey, sure. Karen. Um, it's been a little while. Uh, here is Karen saying, we need to teach about St. Lucian history. We have been yep. taught to be ashamed of our Lucianess, and that is sad. Yep. Um, True. Karen also shared, language is important. How we refer to ourselves, how we speak about ourselves, the words we use is very mm -hmm. is so very important as June has noted. And just before I, I invite you ladies to, to offer um, some more comments, um, I am I just want to, to share some some thoughts here and I want to give a plug to um, 758 books uh, Delia yeah. Fossois. That's right. Um, it is important we we one of the things that I find in St. Lucia is we love to, to take the attitude of Gami here. You know, I know that person when they was so, 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 da, 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 in a derogatory way, mm -hmm. as opposed to, wow, I remember when they were, and it is mm -hmm. so wonderful to see how they have tried, to see where they have gotten to. So for me, it's important that rather than complaining, we must be part of the change we wish to see. We must be embracive of each other. And 758 books come to mind because Dawn, it was you who shared with, with me and then I passed it on yes. that Sylvester's book yes. has copies at 758 books. And they went like hot cake. I spoke to no Delia. time flat, I had people sending me messages. Cook, I'm going to get mine. Cook this, cook, cook I went and I got they one. They went. 
Right. No more books. No more right. copy sheets. All done. I also want to share because Sylvester and I remain in communication. Sylvester has another publication out and he is speaking about doing some stuff with it, introducing it. So I just want to share it with the audience here an audience that will be- He can the, launch it at 758 books. There we go. We can do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. right. Knows how to get us. Next time in St. Lucia, let's do something. So it is yeah. just giving a plug for that. And really folks, maybe we can use, I am happy to use this platform for sharing because yep. sharing truly is caring. Let us help lift each other up. Yes, and where 758 Books is concerned, with Dahlia, this is a labor of love. Yes. Um, she, she lost a lot when COVID came and everywhere had to close down, but she was determined to open that bookshop, which has any solution writer that has a book. The book is at her bookshop. But it is also part of a bigger something called the Arts Village. And I cannot even start to describe the Art Village. The Art Village is not just a place. It is an, an experience. It's an oasis. It is an ex yes, an oasis in the middle of the concrete jungle. It is an experience. And I would tell anybody when you are going to 758 books, you need to sit in that arts village and understand yourself. Everybody who I have taken to the arts village have said, my gosh, I have found my space. It is a place that you can sit and think, you can sit at peace. There's a little river running down at the back and just the water flowing there. Mm -hmm. You need to go. It is an experience. And Delia, I don't know, Delia's mind is so creative. Yes. She is determined to continue this. We're working on some programs together. It is also the home for Youth in Arts Theatre Company. She has provided us with a space for us to rehearse. Lord knows how we need spaces to rehearse in St. Lucia. And the village, there's also, and there's a small performing space. Uh, that same space is good for conferences and meetings. And the arts village is also a fantastic um, performance avenue, performance place. And the masquerade will be there at Christmas time. Okay, nice. Now, let me just put a couple more comments that are coming in. Right. Uh, so, um, uh, Karen again, loving this discussion, moving Quail away from October is something I believe in. Hence, Kai Quail moving Chate Quail, uh, mm -hmm. the National Quail Song Competition, Song Competition in March. It saddens me to still see the ignorance of our people when it comes to the Quail language. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the time. We have about 15 minutes to go. Um, Dawn, you did say to me that, God, we should be pushing two hours. Um, <laughs> you warned him. <laughs> yes, you did. Um, Ronnie has come back and said, so true. The lack of knowledge can be attributed to the school's curriculum. Um, from Trudy, June, you just answered my questions about Michael Walker's booklets. I think in the course of two years, I bought all five booklets and find it so easy to speak Quayle now as to just being able to understand and respond in right. English. Bravo to Trudy. Yeah. I need to get those books as well. <laughs> I got to be no longer available. Ducks. Out of print. Out of print. Um, <laughs> yep. Ronnie has come back. There was a pushback within the society years ago that Quayle was the language of the country people who yeah. came yeah. back. Um, um, Karen, uh, we need to teach about St. Lucian history. We have been taught to be ashamed of our Lucian as that, yeah. that went as well. Um, um, from Mel, we need a greater push to make the performing arts mainstream and part of St. Lucian daily life. That is a great way to teach people of our cultural traditions, myths, and legends. Um, oh, Mel. Mm. I know we've been saying that for so long, but I think what is going to, what has to happen now 
is that people that are involved in the performing arts need to stop waiting for government to do oh, yes. any government to do anything yeah. because ever since that national cultural center went down and the formation of the national cultural policy and cdf that is just about it and we have to now decide how we are going to work together to get something done to get scholarships for our kids to get things done because we don't seem to have anybody to fight our battles for us a minister once asked me, he says, how do I get people to so believe in the arts and appreciate it that they support it? I said, well, that is your job, right? That's your job. I mean, I can say a lot of things, create incentives. People like to get something back for doing something. There are so many people that do not believe that the performing arts has any place anywhere in St. Lucia's curriculum. So we just need, we just need to get over that hurdle. Um, if I can just share something here. Um, I went to a production that Adrian Oje put on some time ago. He was, he was seeking to raise funds um, to send uh, a musician on my, uh, yes. some training at UWE. Um, right. I looked at it one evening, uh, Adrian raised 5,000 US. Mm -hmm. I, I said to him, Adrian, what are you doing here? Oh my God. I could see this being put on as a production at Pigeon Island. Um, and cruise ships, the cruise ships came in, the head of FCCA, the president, a couple of years ago, visited St. Lucia, and she said, we want more stuff that is St. Lucian. And if we can get more stuff, we will let the cruise ships leave St. Lucia at 11 p.m. at night. Well, 11 p.m. Um, because they just go out to sea. Yes, um, but Kirk, yeah. Kirk, yeah. as far, one of the problems with this is people do not understand the costs of doing those productions right? There is a cost. A lot of the times the people who are doing the productions do not have money floating around that they can take from. They need sometimes a year of planning to get those things together. They need a lot of assistance. And the other thing that we're finding since I'm doing traditional masquerade, people don't want to pay for traditional masquerade to be performed. They think it's just, let me give you something. No, there is a cost. There is a cost to everything. When you have companies telling people our minimal cost, our, our fee is $1,400. Everybody say for what? For masquerade? They do not understand the cost. And sadly, they will pay people from overseas. They will pay for them to come and do stuff, but their own people, there is a problem. I have the greatest admiration for Adrian because Adrian is one of the few people in St. Lucia that can actually, stay, can actually stage a successful financial performance. I, although I had a brunch theater on the day when we were supposed to have, have met here, I had a brunch theater, our first youth and arts theater program since COVID. And I'll be very honest with you, Kirk, I was shocked at the response that we got. Uh, I mean, I was shocked. And I think the children, because they real, the youngsters, because they realize the, 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 the things that they got, that, that, the, that the amount of people that were here, were there supporting and screaming and could identify with what they were doing, they got a fever that I had never seen in any rehearsals. Yeah. And I mean, kudos to our Auntie Karen Tobier. She was our tati in that, and she was amazing. And, but people came to me and they said, why don't you have it again? I said, if you can find the money for me to have it, I will have it because it's costly. People don't understand it is costly. You, sometimes you have to be trying to raise funds for over a year before you can do a production. I'm just going to say, and then I'm going to jump on because gosh, we've got 10 minutes left. 
this is one of the reasons why um, I see tourism as the avenue. Um, and tourism can help to bridge that gap, to give us the money. Um, like I said, the cruise ships are interested in it. And I think that I like the direction in which we're going now with tourism, speaking to community tourism, speaking to wanting more authentic St. Lucian experiences. So there is opportunity for us to create product always cognizant of the bottom line. But that's going to be for another show. I'll and, never I'm to, and I'm going to pick up, Dawn, you warned me two hours. Um, <laughs> take my word. <laughs> um, here is something coming back from Yolinda. Uh, I have always considered Patua or Quayol a romantic language. Am yeah. I wrong? And of course, you know, I had to get to that question. And I am staying away from multiplication this time. I'm handing over to you. <laughs> <laughs> that that before, before June jumps in, um, when you hear someone speaking Creole properly, I'm not talking about this hey. stuff when I do it, right? When you hear someone speak that Creole, you just sit back and you just close your eyes because the, the sight is interfering. And just listen to this language flow. At least that's my experience with, with yeah. Creole. To just listen to this language, not being invaded by any other language. And you know, I spoke about the, the, the invasive species English, but it's interesting. Our cousins in Matnik facing the same thing, you know. My colleagues in Matnik say that the French is invading the Creole. And so they're in a battle like us to keep yeah. the Creole, Creole pure. Now it may slide a little easier because Creole kind of have a lot of French words, sounding words in it. And it may be a little more stark for us that's an that's a, uh, um, English speaking um, um, official is our official language. But they are facing it across the seas in Matnik. But Creole yeah. is a beautiful language. June it, is a, it is a beautiful language. And um, I remember years ago, Marcellus Miller, was who was on Radio Caribbean? Yes. I used to love to hear that man speak Creole. I still do. I think he speaks some of the most beautiful Creole ever. And um, I remember when I was working at Folk Research Center, we used to go down. We used to go to the to the other communities in the to do to set up and film and do everything like that. And I remember this man in. So one day I said to him, boy, when I hear you all speak the Creole, I shame to open my mouth the way mm -hmm. that I mash up the Creole when I'm speaking. He said, no, 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 speak it. We'll correct you. That's how you will learn. Don't mm -hmm. let, don't. And I want to tell that to our Creole speakers out there. Do not feel bad when people correct you. That is how you will learn. That, and for those who are correcting, do not come with a, with a level of condescension. Mm -hmm, yes. Correct because you want to teach, mm -hmm. not because you want to make somebody feel bad. I remember once hearing one of the purists saying that if St. Lucia, if you, if you want to call yourself a St. Lucian and you can't speak Creole, you are not a St. Lucia, I say hell to the no. I am a born and bred St. Lucian and as proud of being a St. Lucian as I can be. I was never taught Creole, right? I learned it along the way, but because I do not speak Creole does not make me less of a St. Lucian yes. than people who can speak it. And those people who can speak it need to teach it. They need to teach it without embarrassing and without condescension. Agreed. Okay, so. Um, now I'm going to run through, we've got about seven minutes left. I'm just going to run through the comments that are in right now. So at least I would have them covered uh, for the viewing audience so that they would get a feel for it. And then I'm going to invite um, both of these lovely ladies just to share some closing thoughts. So Ronnie has shared, agreed with June totally. It was a way to divide and conquer. It was a way to be derogatory to our language and those who speak it a direct result of the colonial way of separating and fragmenting the society. Um, Trudy has come up with an interesting one here. Kirk, I'm holding you to a visit to Fongelib on my uh -huh. visit to St. Lucia. 
Um, yes, let me that's when we start our tours. That's mm. correct. And I was just going mm -hmm. to throw in here, a number of folks have reached out to me after the early sessions that we did uh, going into the Ballambush River and finding the petroglyphs. And yes. folks have been asking, when are we going to do another one? Um, I want to throw it out here um, that uh, for us to, to really, I can put it together, a visit to Fonjali, there are some interesting stories. And I'll just share an interesting tidbit as well. I handled the photography as St. Lucia's official photographer for the royal visit. And I really wanted to take the royals down to Fonjalib to introduce them to the location of the Battle of Rabo. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, logistically, it didn't work out. It couldn't work out. But I'm also thankful for the organizers who, who indulged me. They came down, they checked out the place and all of that. That to me is an amazing celebration of who we are. Because really, it was the Battle of Rabo where we whooped the British, resulting in a year of freedom in St. Lucia that actually predates um, the Haitian Revolution. Revolution yep. There's so much for us to be proud of. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to push on with a couple more comments uh, and then invite ladies in. Um, uh, Alcina. Uh, what are three recommended books for learning quail? Uh, any of you ladies can share some thoughts? Boy. Um, I think, mm -hmm. Alcina, please get in touch with the Folk Research Center. Yes. They will be the best people to yes. tell you what books you can use. I know for sure Jason Joseph has a little handbook that actually teaches you just the little phrases and stuff that you should know in Creole. And you can get in touch with him on Instagram, but the place to go is the Folk Research Center and they will guide you accordingly. Jason also has a YouTube channel, so you could yeah. type in his name and, and you can subscribe and, and he has a lot of videos there teaching videos. the language. That, um, so that will help because you'll hear him saying the words, so not just read yep. it, but hear him saying it. And I know that Dawn is going to share that link, so it will be in the way. <laughs> it is, <laughs> Dawn, it is. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, okay. Mel says, just ordered my copy of Traditional Masquerades of St. Lucia. Wow. Great going. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Trudy, okay. where exactly is 758 Books located in La Clary? I will certainly visit. Um, All right. Okay. I'm going to do that. That's Trudy. Yes. Okay, I'll tell. I, I'll just give you a, give you a rough description, and then we will get the proper things and send to you. Yeah. If you go to La Clary, where the National Research Development Foundation used to be NRDF, or the gap opposite the health center, and you come straight up that road, make no turns. You pass the Belgeau turn. Don't go up there. You will see on the right two houses after the Belgeau gap. There you'll see the big sign, 758 books. You park on the road and you walk all the way down inside to the beautiful oasis. Alternatively, you just pass Stevenson King constituency. Oh, office. yes. You pass the bridge and you'll see the sign. <laughs> Thank you, Dawn, because you that's what I was going to say. You June cannot miss the blue. No, June was being politically correct, but I wanted to be politically incorrect, and you beat me to it because I'm oh, God. everybody in St. Lucia knows Stevenson King office. Yes, yes, and you can't miss it. It's so Wonder blue. Up the hill, the yeah. gas sign is massive. You cannot Black miss it. You, you can't miss it. Once you, you pass Stevenson, the bridge and you see the sign. Right when yes. you pass Stevenson King on the left. You will see that sign right in front of you as you're going up there on the right. And you yes. just okay. go down the alley. Yeah. yeah, and just go down the alley. It's a beautiful oasis. And, and I would even encourage any and everyone out of unity because we are so polarized politically. Regardless of what color you favor, if you can't find the office, stop in at Stevenson King's office and ask. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, so now pushing on because we're tight on the time. Um, okay. 
Sylvester, yes, I'm in touch with 758. That's wonderful to know. And the Arts Village, we will be launching there in late November. Look out yes. for it. Yes. Yeah, nice. great going, Sylvester. Um, there is an international, this again is from Sylvester. There's an international connection of traditions we think are only local to us. Living in Central America, I am finding so many connections. For example, the Day of the Dead, celebrated in Mexico and Guatemala, and That's being incorporated one. now into Belize, which parallels all souls in our Christian tradition. Yeah. Many of the symbols use the parallel or many of the symbols use parallel our larger bless and bolom images. Interesting. Mm -hmm. From Karen, again, it goes back to our appreciation of what is ours. Trudy um, uh, has shared, um, uh, where is it? Yep. Back in the 70s, Roderick Walcott Productions came to fruition due to passion and volunteering for the love of theater at all levels. Even That's when right. there was no, when there was more support, no, even when there no was support from government, costly oh, indeed. That, I think she might have wanted to say no support. Yeah. Um, Trudy also shares, I see Nobel Laureate Week, January to February, Independence Month would be a great opportunity for productions theater for marketing to visitors, etc. Again, I know money is required. Um, Roderick has shared, uh, Kurt Dawn June, congratulations on a very enlightening session. Well done. Thank, Thank you, Roderick. You. And we're Thank you. Robert, sorry. So happy to have you on and glad to know that you got so much out of um, this. I, like I said, I think it's your first time on. Uh, Jason Joseph just published a beautiful handbook that's Karen sharing. Uh, yeah. Trudy, thanks, June. I got I got an idea. Yeah. And of course, she's, <laughs> she's tickled. Uh, Yolanda, thank you, Kirk, um, an esteemed panelist for this amazing session. I knew it would be awesome. Thank you thank so you. much, Yolanda. And Yolanda is one of our regulars on. Um, folks, I think that this time we absolutely topped it out with the comments. So I see that there are 25 in, and I'm, I'm certain that if we had gone on some more, there would have been so much more coming in. Uh, we are on the top of the half hour now, or rather on the bottom of the hour. Uh, let me just, just hand over. Um, I'm going to go, uh, first off, I came on with Dawn. Let me just go with June this time, invite June to give some closing comments, then invite Dawn on, and then we will look to just close off what has been an absolutely um, great and engaging session this afternoon. So okay. June, all yours. Thank you. Like I said, St. Lucia is now at a wonderful crossroad. We are now really seeing moves to actually put things St. Lucian together so that we can teach and we can disseminate the information to the folks. I would like to say a special thanks to all the folks who have, who have contributed to um, making us St. Lucian and sharing their work with us. But this is June Creole. This is International Creole Heritage Month. And I would like to say, when say Femme Creole, when I met Tout bagay Creole. Bon moi, heritage Creole, tout simplicie. Merci. Merci, Tonton. <laughs> Thank you. I almost felt like I was going to bite my tongue while you were speaking. So, so glad you said it for me. On all yours. Ladies, Thank you. So, um, <laughs> I dropped, I dropped a, a link and I see you shared it because I just want to, just like June is saying that we feel this, this new energy because, um, you know, the top sets the tone. And Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre has articulated from day one um, that he wants history of our people taught in schools. Mm -hmm. um, by coincidence, because it didn't start under him, this takes a lot of planning. The Ministry of Education is on the verge of going to start teaching Creole yeah, in schools, so. um, like yeah. as a formal language. So we really are at an exciting point. And the reason why I dropped the link for the history of St. Lucia is because as in a meeting where the author was, was lamenting, and it was a public meeting, where the author was lamenting his battle with the Ministry of Education to get this book into the hands of school children. And, I, and I, I couldn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now, yeah. that a book 
call the history of St. Lucia, the Ministry of Education is not battling down his door to say, let's have a partnership. This book needs to be in school. It's yes. the other way around, the author. And so, and you know, people say, you know, this, this book by you done should be in schools and this book should be, you know, yes. you know in one or the other. Because I have seen so many of this, so many times this has happened where you cannot engage or you are told, go and talk to the schools. You know how many schools you have in St. Lucia? Over 100. <laughs> you, over 100. You expect me to engage 100 schools, 100 principals, yeah. right? So the policy has to be set. So with the new um, dispensation from the prime minister, we have seen it already for the celebrations for emancipation. Um, let's see what Junique will, uh, you know, we saw our wars, we see what's, what's going to happen if I'm La Magritte. You know, I'm, I'm personally looking forward to the violin festival. That's a new thing on the Me calendar. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a new, as you said, a, a new buzz in the air. Let's see where it takes us. And one fair to moon to moi heritage quail. Where's that this year? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. And, and back on the book thing, just one minute. Um, I was also trying to get my book because it's the first book written on the traditional masquerade of St. Lucia. When I wasn't getting any response, I reached out to past pupils from St. Mary's College. I'm going to be reaching out to past pupils of St. Joseph's Convent, past pupils of the different secondary schools that teach theater arts to see if they would make donations so that we can at least donate between 20 and 30 books to each of those schools. So that's what we have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks, June. Um, I want to thank um, both of you, Dawn and June, for really, really making this such a warm, lively, and engaging session. Um, like I said, the last three sessions that we had uh, were really devoted to economics, and the truth is the car needs gas to run. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, we, we really don't want to be living in any automated cars and we know that self-driving and all of that is coming along. And I'm saying that really to come back to our human side that we have to embrace, we have to promote. And in this instance, we're speaking to our uniquely Lucian humanity. Um, so I am delighted for where we have taken this conversation today. I want to thank everyone who participated so heartily um, and just really, really saying to everyone, um, what will we say? Bon moi, um, quail. Right. Bon moi, heritage quail. Bon heritage quail. Right. And thank you very much. Tattoo wed. 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 <laughs> thank Folks, you, thank you for inviting me. Have thank a you. good thank you for rest of your evening. Bye now. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Dede. Dede. <laughs> <laughs>